Good morning. For the second Sunday of Advent, our Advent lesson is peace. The second candle of Advent is the candle of peace. The prophet Isaiah envisioned a time of peace in our world, a time when they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, and neither shall they learn war any more. Peace is not just the absence of violence, but the presence of goodwill. The Apostle Paul writes of Jesus, he is our peace. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, he brought peace to our world. He continues to bring peace to our hearts and will bring everlasting peace when he comes again. Peace is like a light shining in a dark place. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and through him, we may know the peace that passes all understanding. of peace humbly laid in the hay. Good morning and welcome to worship at First Baptist Church of Ames. We're delighted you joined us on the second Sunday of Advent. Um, we'd encourage you to use the chat uh, window to share a greeting with, with others here this morning. And your names or in New Hampshire or Colorado or anywhere uh, in between. Welcome everyone. In the way of uh, announcements, uh, we will be celebrating communion at the end of the service. Uh, so you'll want to have your bread and juice uh, ready for that. In addition to our uh, regular, uh, now now regular schedule, um, let's see, well, church school classes meet today and all the classes are meeting this morning. Uh, the trustees meet Tuesday at seven o'clock um, on Wednesday. I think we changed it to it's two, it's Executive Council Tuesday. Nobody here, it's Tuesday, right, sorry. Tuesday, Executive Council, if you're on it, you already know this. Tuesday at 5.15, Executive Council meets um, before trustees. Um, Wednesday, uh, choir is meeting. Uh, we were scheduled for last week, but we're unable to, to meet. So, uh, so we're, we're on for this Wednesday at 6.30. On Thursday, the deacons uh, will meet at 7.15 following the devotion. Next Sunday, uh, following worship, we will have our uh, annual budget and election meeting to adopt a budget for 2021 and elect uh, leaders for the coming year. Everyone's invited to that uh, meeting, which will be uh, on Zoom shortly after the worship service. Uh, then looking ahead on December 20th, that's two weeks, is that two weeks from today? My goodness, it is. Two weeks from today, uh, we'll have our Christmas program, which our youth are uh, putting together, and that'll be after worship on the 20th. We invite you to join us now as we sing our first hymn of the morning, O Come, All Ye Faithful.
angels sing in exaltation. Oh, sing, O oh, ye bright hosts of heaven above. Glory to God, all oh, glory in the highest. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him, Christ the Lord. Our scripture this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, the first chapter, beginning with verse... 46. Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is God's name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their thoughts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promises that he made to the, our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. One of the ways that this year has affected us has to do with music. Attending concerts and public performances, and maybe especially singing, singing with other people is one of the big losses that we have faced. Mindy and Emma and all who have provided music for our services uh, over these past months have just been wonderful. And that music's kind of been a lifeline, but still, if you're like me, you miss getting to sing with other people. I mean, not, I mean Zoom, it, it's, you know, we're singing together, but not hearing one another, but actually being together and singing together, we, we miss that. And we've had, a couple of virtual choir videos, which was fun. And if you can, if you can make it, you know, if you can survive and get through the sermon, there's going to be a virtual Yuletide Orchestra video this morning. I dusted off my saxophone, made a couple of recordings, emailed them to, to Mindy, and I haven't seen the video yet. It's going to be as much a surprise to me as to anybody. Usually this time of year, Choir is in high gear. We would be learning a cantata, thinking there's no way we're going to learn this in time. There's no way we're going to pull this off, but somehow we do. And I miss that. The thing is, music sticks with you. Sometimes you can't get a tune out of your head, even if you wanted to. You may hear a song from years ago, a song you haven't heard in a long time. For, for me, it's, it's likely a song from the 70s or early 80s, and though it's been years, you still know all the words. You, you can sing right along. Music is powerful, but we've not been able to sing together or, or play together because of the risk involved. One of the riskiest behaviors in this pandemic would be to sing together, much more so than simply talking, singing propels respiratory droplets into the air, in some cases on a par with coughing or sneezing. So six feet of distance just, just won't cut it. Singing can actually be dangerous. But we've always known that, haven't we? Singing always has the potential to be dangerous. Singing can inspire and uplift and lead people to rise up and to work for change, which can be threatening, which can make the singing dangerous. 
A song can serve as an anthem for a movement from black spirituals that spoke of freedom to we shall overcome, from blowing in the wind to what's going on to fight the power. Music can be dangerous. Now, one song in scripture, above all others, has been viewed as a dangerous song. And it's our scripture from the morning, Mary's song. It's known as the Magnificat. It begins with my soul magnifies the Lord. Magnifies being Magnificat in Latin. Now we like to romanticize Jesus' birth and make it a sweet story of a young mother and her child, but that's not exactly the way we read it in the Bible. There's a definite edge to it. Mary is engaged, but not yet married, when she has this very strange encounter that we looked at last Sunday. A messenger from God, an angel, tells her that she has found favor with God. She will bear a son who will be God's, God's son, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary believes which is as much a miracle as anything. Mary believed and said yes to God, and right away, it causes her trouble. She's pregnant, not yet married, which is a bad combination, an especially bad combination in that culture. She's worried, she's frightened, she's no doubt overwhelmed. The angel told her that her relative Elizabeth, well up in years, was also with child. And so Mary leaves home, she leaves town, to go and to stay with his older relative, Elizabeth. She finds that Elizabeth is indeed pregnant in her old age. And Elizabeth is maybe the only one who could understand, maybe the only one who could really believe Mary. And Elizabeth's words to her are pure grace. Blessed are you among women, she says. Now, it is while with Elizabeth that Mary sings her song. I wonder if the support and the love of Elizabeth helped Mary to burst forth in singing. Mary's song is filled with gratitude and great hope. She is very prophetic. She speaks boldly as to how things are and to how things should be in God's world. She speaks both of what God has done for her and what God will do and is doing in the world. The angel had told Mary, do not be afraid. Mary's song is, is certainly unafraid. The word that comes to mind really when we read the Magnificat is revolution. God means to turn the world upside down and it all begins with Mary. To accomplish God's work, God chooses a poor, unmarried, peasant girl in an occupied backwater country. From the very start, God is turning things upside down, doing the unexpected. Mary looks ahead to the implications of this child. The proud will be scattered, the powerful will be pulled from their thrones, the weak and the poor will be lifted up, the hungry will be filled, the rich oppressors will be sent away empty. We tend to overlook this side of Mary. This, this, this message really isn't in most of our Christmas carols. There were places in Latin America just a few years ago where the public reading of the Magnificat was forbidden as a subversive activity. Well, with all that business about the mighty being pulled from their thrones and being replaced by the weak and the poor. I mean, just to read this scripture could, have, could get you arrested, and in some places the world probably still can get you arrested to read it publicly. It's considered dangerous. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German pastor and theologian who was executed by the Nazis, called the Magnificat the most passionate, the wildest, one might even say the most revolutionary hymn ever sung. When Martin Luther translated the Bible into German, he left the Magnificat in Latin. The, print, the German princes who supported 
and protected Luther in his struggles against Rome, took a dim view of the social and political implications of this song, what with its reversal of social structures. So Luther's friends and supporters being in high places, he decided it was probably best just to leave that part in Latin. Now, we're not kings, we're not rulers, but if we're honest, these words make us a little uncomfortable too. Because on a global scale, in the big picture, we are all wealthy. We read Mary's words about the poor being lifted up and the rich being brought low, and we have to ask, how exactly is this good news for us? Well, sometimes before the gospel can be good news, it has to be heard as bad news. And what this may be saying to us is we have to know how poor we are before we can receive God's gift of redemption. We can be too full of ourselves and all of our things to have room for God. The Bible doesn't glamorize poverty. Jesus did not condemn people of means who gathered around him. People like Joseph of Arimathea or Nicodemus. There were a group of women who supported Jesus' ministry out of their resources. Some were apparently well-to-do. But it is instructive that God seems again and again to work through the poor and the lowly and the unlikely. Fishermen and tax collectors and shepherds and a poor girl like Mary. Maybe what this is about is that living in poverty those living in poverty know their need, while those who are wealthy may not. The wealthy can feel like they've got it all together. They have everything they need or they can easily get it. But those in poverty know better. Now, this may seem like an odd scripture for the second Sunday of Advent, a day that we traditionally think about peace. Mary is bold, she is courageous, she is joyful. She is a prophet, saying that through her child, God means to turn the world upside down, which is all nice, but does it really sound like peace? Well, here's the thing. Peace is a lot more than just the absence of fighting. It is the presence of goodwill. Mary's people, the Jewish people, lived under Roman occupation. And Roman soldiers kept the peace by keeping the population under the constant threat of violence. The Pax Romana wasn't really peace at all. It was an arrangement that harmed everyone who lived under it. The injustice in Mary's community meant that a deep peace wasn't possible for any of them. Injustice affects everyone. Mary's song with its soaring gratitude to God and recognition of God's favor and grace speaks of God turning things upside down. And what we need to understand is that in the end, everyone benefits from this. The proud and the powerful who will be relieved of their swelled heads, the hungry who will be filled with good things, the rich who are sent away empty so that they will have room in their hearts for the things that money cannot buy. Now, because her song is dangerous, we may not think of it in terms of peace, but that is exactly what Mary is singing about. Peace does not mean being quiet in the face of oppression or accepting things as they are. Peace is not ignoring the world around you while you live blissfully in a bubble. Peace comes in the midst of the storms of life. We can know peace in times of trouble as a gift from God, a confidence in God's care, a provision of God despite the circumstances that we face. Even amid strife and uncertainty, even in the middle of a pandemic, we can know God's peace. In, and God's peace is something that we join with God in working for. Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. 
not the prince of passivity. He offers the peace of God, and this means justice and equity and welcome and goodness and grace for everyone. It means bringing reconciliation to those who have been estranged from one another. It means bringing reconciliation to those who are estranged from God. And we are called to have a part in bringing God's peace to others. You might think of peace as contentment, maybe. Maybe sitting in your favorite chair in front of a warm fire while the snow gently falls to the ground in a winter wonderland. God may bless us with that kind of contentment. But if your neighbor can't pay the gas bill and is shivering and struggling to get by, it's hard to feel quite so content about it. And so part of our calling is to bring God's peace to others, which, as Mary tells us, can come in very tangible ways. Our efforts in this season to reach out and to care for others in need and to work to make our community a more fair and just place for everyone are ways that we are involved in bringing God's peace. Mary does not have a sonogram. She does not have a husband. She does not have wealth or power or privilege. All she has, really, all she knows is that the God who chose her will be a part of what comes next. And apparently, for Mary, that is enough. Knowing that gives her peace. Peace enough to sing. May we all join in that song. Amen. Their congregation's spiritual guidance. Pastors are called to offer their congregation's spiritual guidance and encouragement. As we try to navigate through the COVID-19 pandemic, pastors are comforting worshipers and communities in extraordinary ways. So people continue to feel cared for and connected to each other and to God. Pastoral leadership gives us hope for today and hope for tomorrow. They remind us that hope, which is grounded in our faith, trusts that God is with us always, no matter the circumstances. Hope for today and hope for tomorrow is our theme for the 2020 Retired Ministers and Missionaries Offering, RMMO. On behalf of American Baptist Churches USA, RMMO is a personal offering rooted in humble thanks for the immeasurable ways ministers and missionaries have guided each of us in our spiritual journeys toward faithful and committed discipleship. Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13 states, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. The Retired Ministers and Missionaries Offering, RMMO, originated in the mid-1930s when American Baptist congregations received a Communion Fellowship offering on the first Sunday of each month to support retired ministers, spouses, and elderly clergy within their churches. In 1977, American Baptist Churches USA launched RMMO to continue this appreciation of God's service. RMMO is a way for American Baptist congregations to honor retired ministers, missionaries, or their widowed spouses who have given 15 or more years of service to the ABC family. The offering provides emergency and other financial assistance and annual thank you checks to over 3,000 recipients. During these unconventional times and throughout the American Baptist history, pastors and missionaries have stepped up 
to help their congregations and communities become a resource that those in need can rely upon. Retired pastors are being called upon to offer hope in different ways. Keeping in touch by phone, offering prayers and blessings, online support, remote preaching and teaching, virtual worship, and food donations. The funds raised from RMMO go towards supporting these pastors, missionaries, and their families who supported you when you needed You can make a difference please consider a donation to RMMO to sustain the women and men who have been tireless in their efforts to carry forth God's work. Thank you. Our church receives two uh, special offerings in this month of December. Uh, the first is the Retired Ministers and Missionaries Offering. Uh, whenever um, I give towards the RMMO, I think of folks who have served our church, uh, the Boardmans, the Nethercots, I think of Gloria Belli and Margot Malgren. Um, I think of the Shiremans, Wayne and Irene, uh, members of our congregation who served faithfully for many years. You may think of retired missionaries, folks like Dan Buttry, uh, our friend who has been our, with, with us uh, before, who's newly retired. So uh, as, you, as we pass our virtual offering plate this morning, uh, we invite you to give towards the retired ministers and missionaries offering. Uh, we again want to thank everyone for your continuing support of our church during this time. You can mail your offerings to the church. You can give um, online from our website. There's a donate button where you can give via, via PayPal. Let's pray. We thank you, dear God, for all of your marvelous gifts. We thank you for those who have supported us and guided us in the past. We pray that you would take these offerings, take our offerings of resources and time and love and compassion, and use them to further your kingdom. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Loving God, our souls magnify you. Our spirits rejoice in our Savior. We give thanks for the gift of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks that Mary was willing to believe that what seemed impossible could and would happen. We are thankful for her vision of what that birth would mean. Help us to have that kind of faith and that kind of vision. Open our hearts and minds to believe that your promises can come to surprising fulfillment. Show us how we can best serve you with mercy and humility, both experiencing your peace and bringing your peace to others. In this world that knows precious little of it, we would be bold to pray for peace this morning. We pray for places beset by war, and all those who suffer. We pray for those in our own communities who feel vulnerable. We pray for those whose lives are filled with conflict. We pray for our own nation that is so filled with that kind of conflict. We pray for peace in human hearts and peace among peoples. And we pray that even in the midst of troubled and uncertain times, we might know your peace in a deeper and fuller way. We pray for all those who are grieving in this season. We lift up all who are lonely. We pray for those who mourn, for all those for whom this holiday season brings sorrow, and ask that your peace be with all who suffer loss. This morning we pray for Beth and for her family. We pray for Jim as he moves back to New Jersey. We pray for so many who are suffering from COVID. For Gerilyn's brother and wife. We pray for Becca's uh, boss and husband. We pray for Mora. We pray for medical personnel who uh, 
work in, in such difficult settings. Lord, we pray for Jack's brother, Jim. We lift up Chris and her family and her friend and family as well. We pray for Bruce. We pray for Anne's family as they face a difficult decision. In all those places in our lives, Lord, where we do not feel peace, we pray that you would come and fill us. Lift us, give us your peace. In all this we ask in the name of the one who is our peace and who taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. together at the Lord's table to celebrate God's great love shown us in Jesus Christ. This is God's table and all are welcome here. This is a table where we know and we celebrate and we experience the peace of God. Let us pray. Oh God, we come to this table with hope we come to this table with joy. We come to this table with love. And we come to this table hoping and praying for your peace. As we partake these symbols of your great love for us, showing us in Jesus. These symbols of Jesus' sacrifice for us. We pray that this might be for us spiritual food. To nurture us that we may serve you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The bread of life, take and eat. After the supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he poured it and said, This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you for the forgiveness of sin. As often as you drink this cup, do this in remembrance of me. The cup of blessing, take and drink.
our longtime tradition is to conclude the communion service by singing, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds, as we've done before. Uh, as you sing at home, uh, you might just extend your arms as we typically join hands. You might just join your ar- extend your arms, uh, symbolically taking hold of the hand of that person uh, out there. Let us sing. Okay. 